Well, happy Christmas morning. This is Pastor Carl from Redeemer Church coming to you uh, on this morning, and I pray that already your day has been filled with joy and the peace of Christ, and that the house is filled with noises of food cooking, children unwrapping gifts, family coming over, and all that wonderful bustle of Christmas. For those of you who have maybe a little bit more relaxed Christmas, maybe even a lonely and a sad Christmas, and there's many of us in that situation, then we come to you as well with prayers and this short devotion that hopefully will help you um, to see the peace and the joy and the greatness of God and the greatness of Christmas, even amidst sometimes what can be very difficult circumstances. So all week I've had stuck in my head the poem by um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And there's a carol that's been made of his song as well, of this poem as well. And it's called Christmas Bells. I want to read it for you and then offer just a couple of reflections and scripture before we say, uh, say goodbye. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then, from each black, accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south, and with the sound, the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And it was as if an earthquake rent the hearthstones of a continent, and made forlorn the households born of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Now, that poem was written by Longfellow in the midst of the American Civil War in 1864. And it's understandable that little mid part when he talks about war and the cannons thundering from the south, you can begin to understand why he's, he's needing the encouragement of Christmas all the more. Because he's in the midst of a war, literally. And the poem is, is quite lovely and it speaks to a number of things. And one of the things I love is it starts out with him saying, these Christmas bells, every year, every time they chime out the bells from the churches and from the belfries, they remind him of the gospel, of the Christmas story. And that that song rings throughout the world. And it's interesting as well that he calls it this unbroken song. Um, and the idea of that Longfellow was pointing out is that worship is something that has been going on for eternity. And so when the bells chime on Christmas Day and when you and I get to church or even now as you're worshiping, as you listen and as you uh, spend Christmas at home with your families and put God at the center of it, hopefully, even as you do that, we have to be careful with the language that we use sometimes that says we come to start worship or that worship has begun. Um, there's a truth in that, that when we come to church and we start worshiping ourselves, we do begin ourselves to worship. However, what Longfellow reminds us is that the eternal song of Christmas and of the gospel has been going on eternally. It's like it's a river that has been flowing forever. And when you and I enter into it, we just enter into the stream as it's already been going. We enter and add our voices to the throng. And that's what he means by this unbroken song. But then he gets to the crux of the matter and why Christmas is so important. He gets to the point of war. When he talks about the cannons from the south, he's talking about the American Civil War. And he says he notices something that we all notice if you've been a Christian or alive for any length of time. You realize that although there is this eternal song of peace and goodwill uh, and the claims that if Christ has come, if Christmas is true, if the Christmas story is true, then we have a bit of a paradox because we have a life that we're supposed to We think about peace. If peace has come, why is there no peace? And this is where Longfellow gets quite profound. And he says that the sound of the cannons and the, and the, and the voices and the work of, of, the, of the wrong, and the, they mock the song. 
They mock the song of Christmas because they say it's not true. It's not true. And they make us believe that it's not true because of what we're struggling through in life at times. And so he gets to that very clear and important point that Christmas comes to answer. If God is good, and if Jesus brought peace when he came, well, where, where are they? <laughs> where is the peace? Uh, we don't see it. Even now, not just geopolitically, we see wars happening, certainly in the Ukraine and Russia, but even in our homes, even in our own hearts, there's no peace. So how do we answer that? And Longfellow attempts to answer it, but remember, he's not scripture. He's a poet. And as, although he does a pretty good job, he falls short of getting as nuanced as the Bible does and of the true story does. And before we get back to Longfellow to see, we th I think, how he tries to resolve it, let me just quote one passage of scripture. It's not a normal Christmas passage, but it's a great passage. And it's in Hebrews 2, verses 6 to 9. Let me read that. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Now, that's a, what a great passage. Now, the Hebrews writer is quoting Psalm 8 in that part there about what is man that you're mindful of him. And in it, he says, humans have been made. This is what we know from scripture, what we're told. Humanity, and especially the people of God, are made to, to rule the earth to dominate it, and not in a domination sort of way, but to steward it, to care for it, to nurture it, to cause for its flourishing. And everything then has been put under the feet of humanity. We are lords of the earth by God's decree. God has made us co-regents. And yet, although this is the case, this is what scripture says, um, what Longfellow is pointing out and what this Hebrews writer is pointing out is the world hasn't seen to got the memo. <laughs> because if everything has been put under the feet of humanity, if we are truly the crowning achievement of God's creation and to rule over uh, nature, why is it that um, it doesn't seem to go that way? Why is it that hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, poisonous snakes, diseases, why do they all resist our lordship and actually seem to thwart it at every, at every point and even threaten to turn it back? And the Hebrews writer resolves this problem perfectly, which is not surprising because the Bible is the word of God. When he writes, we don't see, see what we don't see, let me just read it. <laughs> but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So notice what he is saying. We do not see everything under our feet, but what we do see is Jesus. Now that's important because in this world, you, when you look around, you don't see everything under our feet. Many of you are right now in homes and struggling through Christmas that is not full of laughter, not full of joy. You're, you feel abandoned. You may have been abandoned. Uh, you're alone. You're, you're suffering. You're struggling. Maybe somebody in your life has recently passed away or is in the hospital. Um, life has occurred and Christmas is not a time of great joy. And you don't see everything under your feet. And oftentimes, if, you have, if you're not feeling that now, you will at some point. Every human does. And what the Hebrews writer says is this. You don't see that reality yet in its fullness. You don't see that you are Lord. But what you do see is Christ. And when you look at Christ, when Hebrews writer looks at Christ, what does he see? He sees a God who is crowned with glory, yet he suffered. We see one who tasted death for everyone. And so what we see is this. This is Christmas at its core. In our troubles, we see that Jesus suffered. He was, And yet, even though he suffered, he was loved by God. He was glorified in his suffering and because of his suffering. And he was honored. And so he tasted death so that for everyone, all who would believe, so that we, when we taste death, in this world, the effects of death and sin, on one half, we see, we, we face that. And when we do, we can look to the cross. And when we look to the cross, what we see is hope. 
that our trouble is temporary. It's not forever. And that we can endure because we know the last word for us is not going to be misery and suffering, but restoration and renewal. And because of that, we have hope. Because of Christmas, we have hope. And Longfellow touches on that in the last stanza of the poem, when he says, the wrong shall fail and right prevail. When he says the wrong shall fail, you see, this is good wording. It means right now it may not be failing. Right now the wrong in your life and in the world may be having sway. It may be, it may be on the throne at the moment. It may seem that way anyway. But it will fail and the right will prevail. And so we know we can endure because Christ has endured for us. And there is a great restoration coming. And when he talks about the right prevailing, the right began to prevail at Christmas. Christmas Day is the dawning of God's prevailing in the world. And because of that, we have reason to rejoice. There's reason to celebrate. There's reason to turn your Christmas morning celebrations into times of prayer and scripture and giving great gifts in the anticipation of God returning and because you have received that great gift. If you're a Christian, enjoy today, guys. Enjoy it. Spend time with your families as best you can and remember those who are not having the best Christmas and call them, pray for them, text them, reach out to them, visit them, drop off some food, invite them over. And if you're one of those people who are struggling right now, understand that you have a God who felt abandoned and he was abandoned on the cross. You have a God who suffered unjustly. You have a God who suffered great physical pain, so you may, which you may be going through. You have a God who was a, a God, was a man of sufferings. He was acquainted with sorrows. And as a result, he knows what you're going through. He didn't just struggle, and, or did, he doesn't just struggle with you from afar, but he's there with you now, even now encouraging you and telling you it's going to be okay. And so turn to God. If you're a skeptic watching this, thank you for actually watching. Run to this God who was given to you on Christmas Day. Accept him. Embrace him as your Lord. He's your Lord one way or the other. One day you will stand before him. But I urge you to accept him now so that when you do stand before him, you will do so as a son and not as a rebel. With that, my friends, have a Merry Christmas. If there's anything at all you need over this next week or so when the church office is closed, give us a call. Send us a text. Reach out to us on social media, through Facebook, through any other thing. We want to be with you. We want to connect with you. And if there's a need that arises, we want to be able to help you with it. Thanks so much. Merry Christmas. And we'll see you in the new year.